The news today, ESPN's got an extension now on the championship games. I think a lot of it may have to do with football. Just under a billion dollars, a billion dollars they're paying now. Is there anything left of the uh, amateur part of this athletics as opposed to the professional? Well, there's a lot of value in college sports. It's exciting. Uh, and, of course, that's for 40 sports, men's and women, you know, the, for a billion dollars or 100 million or so a year. You know, the college football playoffs are going to go for a billion five to 2.3 billion just for the playoffs in college football. So this shows the disparity between college football and all the other sports out there. So, so where does this all go next? As you know, some coaches, including Mr. Harbaugh, my coach at Michigan, has said we should start paying the players. Is that inevitable? Well, a couple things. One, great games this weekend. Both games went down to the last play. So the player movement really didn't hurt the quality of the competition. Where it's headed... I think you're going to have to pay the players. I mean, the, uh, college football is the number two sport in America. In attendance, in television ratings, generates six to eight billion dollars a year. And I think what you, those players deserve to be paid. And I think you see the courts now recognizing that, that um, it, the players, you can't restrict their trade, their motion, they need to be paid and share in some of that money. What does that look like, though? Where does that money come from? Does that flow from the schools directly, or is that going to come from the NCAA directly? It's going to come from the schools, uh -huh. right? And what you're going to see, I think, eventually is the players will be bargaining collectively. I think that they're probably going to have to do individual contracts so that they can restrict the movement. I mean, yeah. competitors, universities, well, are competitors, yeah. uh, cannot restrict the movement of players without compensation. And with that kind of money generating around, you're going to have to bargain collectively and guys will have to do individual contracts. That's going to be interesting, and of course that's going to be messy for a lot of schools. And I, I am curious, I mean, not to brag, David, but Northwestern University, the Wildcats, the team, they had actually attempted several years ago to unionize, and of course we, that ran into uh, uh, failures in the court system. What's different now that would allow something like that to happen that they couldn't do uh, 15 years ago? I think the money yeah. has just become so yeah. significant. So, look, if you take a step yeah. back, it's the success of college sports. It's yeah. amazing. People love it, but it's huge business. And I think to, as a fairness principle, mm -hmm. the guy, you know, you think about the college football playoff, they're going to be getting over $100 million per, for one game. Yeah. Should the guys participating in that game share in that economic success? Mm -hmm. I think 9 out of 10 reasonable people say yes. So I think, you know, the money's so overwhelming but how, that it's... But how much, how much do you think could actually go to the players? I mean, we're talking a situation where a college player, in theory, a top-tiered college player, could be making more than maybe sort of a middle-of-the-road professional athlete? I don't know if it goes yeah. that far, yeah. but I think there'll be some sharing. Yeah. And, of course, you have other things, too, work conditions, mm -hmm. you know, how much they do in training, what the off-season looks yeah. like, how people move around. And yeah. it's complicated because the people are there to get an education, so you're trying to balance education, economic fairness, and keeping a, a, a reasonable model. Model. And those are the yeah. things the industry is uh, grappling with. And it's quite complex. And part of the hard part is it's complex in a fragmented industry. Well, exactly. It's complex and it's a huge change, a real sea change. Who's going to really be in charge of managing that sea change? Is the NCAA up to that job? Not everybody has complete confidence in the NCAA. I think the NCAA has a very difficult job. There are 1,100 members. We're talking probably 130 football members here, and even you could argue a smaller number. And so the NCAA is in a no-win situation. And the challenge is it's very fragmented. Industry, colleges, as you know, the colleges switch conferences, coaches switch teams, athletic directors move around, presidents move around, players are restricted, payers are not compensated. That's not going to fly. So I think you're gonna, it's, it's either going to have one or two things. The courts are going to lead like they did with the NAL. People knew the NAL was coming for five years. The industry could not agree. The courts led the way. Same thing here. The courts will either lead the way, or I hope, because I love the, the sports, uh, I'd love to see the industry coalesce and come together with the solution. So it'll be one or two, the courts or the industry. The reason it's up in the air is it's so fragmented. So you say you love the sport. We do. I know Romain loves the sport. How do you preserve the sport, though, the competitiveness of the sport? Because in professional, for example, you have to really manage parity because otherwise you get the haves and the have-nots and the games aren't very good. Right. It's going to be very complicated. You have uh, all those issues, education, parity, fairness, very complex issues. And that's why it's hard to find a consensus amongst competitors of what to do. And so that's why it's going to be tricky. And that's why an inability to agree could lead to the courts deciding and not the industry. Uh, we've had a little space now since uh, the name image likeness uh, became uh, law of the land, for lack of a better phrase here. Is there anything we can learn from the rollout and implementation of that 
in, 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 in terms of extrapolating what a rollout of actually paying the payers directly would be? Well, they were on, uh, NIL was hoped to be uh, based on endorsement revenue. Mm -hmm. It became a legal way to pay players. Right. And it had unintended uh, consequences mm -hmm. in the competition of the sport. And people don't like that. And that's why I think it would be better if you had it, uh, things collectively bargained and people did contracts because you'd have predictability, you'd have rules, it would be better organized. The NIL kind of led to a free-for-all and the intended consequence and intention was to pay the players for endorsements and yeah. it came really pay to play. So uh, we've talked about some of the disparities among uh, schools. What about among sports? Because we're talking about football here. What does this do to the so-called lesser sports in a lot of these schools? Do they get left behind? It's primarily football. Basketball has meaningful value, too. But the rest of the sports are really not in the same area. And one of the concerns there, one, are Title IX, how it would affect uh, women's athletics. And two is the Olympic movement. The Olympic movement internationally, many of the best athletes in the world come to America to train, as well as the American athletes. And that system has provided for, that, for those sports. So those sports uh, are being underwritten by the revenues primarily from football. And so if that money goes to the players, that money may not be there for those other sports. George, you've been on the inside of so long. If you were to guess, how long is this process going to take? When will this settle back down? I think it'll take three to five years to, to shake out. I think if the industry does it, it'll be within the next three years. If it's settled through the courts, it'll take a little longer, maybe five years. It gets, gets to this idea, though, also of just amateur sports in general, and in addition to the actual collegiate itself, that whole universe of Olympic athletes who, of course, have had their own battles and being able to uh, get compensated for uh, their images and for their performance as well here. Have we kind of moved to the stage in society now where there really won't any be true amateur sports, at least not at the elite level? No, I think there will be. Yeah. I mean, elite golf for these other sports, I think, it will, will remain think, amateur. Okay. But, like, but like the Olympics, think yeah. about the Olympics. There was a time where you couldn't have pros in the Olympics. Yeah. They transitioned. They modernize, and people love the Olympic Games. I think that's my hope is the same can happen for college athletics. But you're gonna might have to separate football and basketball from the other sports because those issues are quite different than the other sports. It's all inevitable. Is it good for the sport, mm -hmm. in your judgment? Well, I think it will be. You know, we've heard so much negativity about the transfer portal and player movement. Look, those games this weekend were yeah. fantastic. So I think the game will stay true. This is a choppy period. It's an evolution, hopefully not a revolution. Yeah.